Hi, everybody. Good evening. Welcome to Evoke Therapy Program's broadcast. Today is Tuesday, March 12th, 2024. Tonight is a live Q&A. So for those of you that might be new to this format, I take pre-submitted questions. You can always send in questions in advance to webinar at evoketherapy.com. By the way, you can use that email address to request slides. If I ever do a presentation where you want a copy of the slides, we're happy to share those with you. If you want to make suggestions, make comments, you can always send in those via the email address webinar at evoketherapy.com. The pre-submitted questions, of which we have one tonight, the pre-submitted questions will go at the top of the queue, and then any of the live audience questions uh, will be taken in the order that they are received. Before I get into tonight's first question and, and whatever the subsequent questions are, I just want to make the one announcement each each time I focus on one thing. Um, we have a, a, an intensive, that a, a therapy intensive. We call it Finding You. This is our flagship pr program. In my opinion, in my opinion, and this comes from my own experience having been a participant of something like this, this is the best thing that you, could, you can do to springboard into your work if you don't quite know what your, your work is or to accelerate your work. It's, it, it is a powerful experience in self-love and compassion. And in that space, that safe space, you really do get to explore things in a way that, that's hard to do with all the noise and the busyness that happens in our life with, with one or two hours a week of psychotherapy. So March 20th, we're up against that. It. It's a week from tonight. March 20th is the starting date. If you're interested, you can email intensives at evoketherapy.com and we can help you get signed up for it. Um, I, I highly recommend it. I have been to somewhere in the neighborhood of 10 myself as a participant, and it's something that I still do. And I, I share just a few weeks back, uh, I went back to my my group and, and attended another one of these and, and had maybe, and this is not hyperbole, it, it's on par with at least a tie with the best four and a half days of my life. So it's a four and a half day program, all inclusive outside of Park City, Utah. Intensives at evoketherapy.com is the place to go. All right, let's get to the pre-submitted questions before I get into any of the live questions for this evening. Somebody writes in and says, how do you know if you're doing the work? Sometimes it feels like pseudo healing or just gaining information. Other times it feels healing. It's been two and a half years since my ex-husband found out about my affair and we separated. It is so hard to forgive myself and fully move forward without feeling I've ruined my life and or the better is on the other side is safe for those who are good or, or are victims like my ex. Good is not for bad people like me who have sinned. So tired of being the victim to my own story, not being able to get out of my own way. You know, the first thing I want to say is my heart breaks for you in this process. Like to hear your question, my heart breaks for you. And I know what that feels like. And I'm going to kind of take some of the points in your questions point by point, because there's really three or four questions in there or three or four ideas in there. But the first thing I want to say is I'm absolutely sorry for the pain that you're experiencing. You know, I got to a point in my life where I realized that some of my pain is self-created. And some of my pain is because it's things that happened to me. But really what the breakthrough moment was for me was it doesn't matter. Both are pain. Right? It's not like I'm less deserving of compassion or less deserving of love because I have some self-created pain because of my mistakes or my choices in life. In fact, I, I would argue, even in a religious context, I would argue that's when we need the most love. And I wrote this today. I'm actually going to share this. I haven't shared it. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to share it on the screen with those of you that are watching. I wrote this today. And I'm going to share it on my social media tomorrow. But uh, because I saw this question pop up, I went and grabbed it really quick. And I wrote this, I said, I think that sins, when we think of sins, that they're not about what we should or shouldn't do or about obedience to God. At least that's my perspective and I honor everybody's perspective. But this is a, a, a psychotherapeutic way of looking at sins. I think sins are about betraying the laws of nature, betraying ourselves, essentially. That is what, what is meant by the phrase, by the term that we've all heard that says virtue is its own reward. The punishment for the sin or the reward for not sinning is its own karma. It's, it's, it's instant karma. If I am kind and loving to others, 
the reward of that is not what I get back from them, but the reward is that I'm in a place where I'm full of joy and happiness, and therefore I have extra to give to somebody. And if I'm unkind or cruel to others, the, the, the punishment for that is not the way that uh, some sort of deity or higher power might punish me, but the punishment is I'm living in that moment in misery, in unhappiness, and in pain. So because of our context, and maybe this is your context, and, and maybe it's not, because of our context, this idea of sinning, which I think the prophets and the philosophers and the teachers were really trying, trying to teach us about, somehow that got converted into a should and a shouldn't. Instead of what I think was probably the original context with these enlightened people, I think it was more like, this is what works. And if we're committing a sin, it means that we're suffering already. And the sin is just the outward manifestation of that. So what I would say to you is there, there was the, you know, I wrote this about people who, who cheat people who, who commit infidelities. And I wrote this a long time ago that before some, and I've worked with lots of people in these circumstances before somebody betrays somebody else, they have betrayed themselves. They don't know how to stand up for themselves. They don't know how to get what they need. They, they don't know how to, to, to fight in a healthy way for the compromise or the negotiate the negotiation that needs to happen in a marriage. And they feel like, and a lot of people feel this way, they feel like they're being forced into this box, into this, this prison. And so what happens in that, that prison that, that gets created for us and to us at the same time, what happens is we build up resentments. And almost in every case, whether it's conscious or not, my experience of people who have cheated on their spouses, if we track it back and we take enough time to look at it, they will see that they use that resentment to justify the act of betrayal. In other words, I deserve to be happy. There's nothing wrong with me doing this thing. I'm just looking for happiness. So I don't think about people being unworthy of love. I don't think about people who make big mistakes being undeserving of love. What I have come to know, probably because of my own fallibilities and my own mistakes, is that we all deserve love. We all need love. And though much of our, our pain is, is self-chosen, meaning it can come in the wake of our mistakes, that's the time in life when we need love the most. I love the, the TED talk that was given a few years ago that's entitled Everything You Think You Know About Addiction Is Wrong by Johan Hari. And he makes this really compelling case using both case study and his own research, but also the latest data, the latest science to, to show us that what the addict is searching for is, is a sense of connection. They're, they're searching for the feeling that comes when we are deeply connected to another person and we feel that. And so whether it's cheating or gambling or uh, you know, sex addiction or whether it's, it's drugs or alcohol, doesn't matter what the, the symptom is, that's the soul's yearning. But, but, the hard part is that our guilt and our fear and our shame block us from healthy self-care. So we deny ourselves in relationship and in life to be a good person because of what we have been taught about life and relationships and love. And then what, what wells up inside of us is, is resentment. And we end up feeding, as it were, metaphorically speaking, on cotton candy and junk food, so to speak. Sometimes in real life, if eating is your drug of choice, if food is your drug of choice, you can do that. But we, we consume whatever the thing is to fill this gaping hole inside. And we don't understand why, because, because we think that guilt and shame are our are, are moral North Star. I want to be clear with all of you listening, no matter who you are, no matter what your role is, no matter what your circumstances are, getting healthy or getting healthier and healing, becoming more enlightened, more aware, you are inevitably going to bump up against guilt and shame. It is going to feel scary. And it's going to produce guilt and shame. It's going to trigger those feelings in you. Otherwise, everybody would do it. 
I was just reading a book by Joseph Campbell and he was analyzing the myth of the Garden of Eden. And I, I've actually written my own analysis of, of this myth in the journey of the heroic parent. And he was talking about a different aspect, a different level of looking at it. And he was saying that the sin, if you will, the departure from the commandment to not eat of the fruit of the tree of good and evil is what separated the Adam and Eve from God. In other words, this introdu introduction of good and evil were the thing that separated them from God, from the transcendent, from, from everything. It's very similar to the poet's comments, Rumi's comments of there is a field beyond right, right and wrongdoing, right doing and wrongdoing. There is a field I will meet you there. I just shared the other day the, the post by Rumi also, and I love this post where he says, come, come, whoever you are, wanderer, worshiper, lover of leaving. It doesn't matter. Ours is a, not a caravan of despair. Come, he says, even if you've broken your vow a thousand times, come yet again, come, come. You see, we've been misled by the culture, not just our culture, cultures and throughout time, we've been misled that the way to peace, the way to, to greater meaning, the way to greater love and compassion and empathy is through the, the path of doing it the right way and not making mistakes, being good, if, if you will. But that's an impossible assignment to be good. Nobody's ever done it. There are some religions who believe that certain people have, certain individuals, one or two, but my experience as a psychotherapist, as a person on this earth, nobody can measure up to that idea of being good. So virtue is its own reward. The good we do won't be rewarded by God, I think, at least in my perspective. The good we do is the reward. The outward manifestation of our healing health and alignment with the universe. So if you can start to think about sinning and mistakes as parts of yourself that need healing and love and compassion and safety. And I know we've been taught you got to punish the sinner. I know we've been taught you have to, you know, you have to use anger and, and, and punishment and shame when people make mistakes because we want to control people because we don't want anyone to experience pain or sadness or grief or, lo or loss. But there is another way. So that's the first thing I would say to you now. There are many ways to this idea, this experience that I'm describing. My way that I talk about is you've got to find an empathic therapist, a patient, loving, and kind empathic therapist, or guide, or mentor, or sponsor. You've got to find them. And you've got to spend enough time around you that their sensibility starts to seep into you, to take root into you. Because the fundamental building block of the human psyche is its context. That's what builds us. You know, we come with our own nervous system. We come with our own predispositions. But, but by and large, our context shapes us. The critical voice, the voice that you are, are, are giving, giving a voice to, the ideas that you are giving a voice to in your question, those come from your context. Those aren't true. Like Jamie Gill says, the wonderful thing about psychotherapy is that we get into a context. What was bad at home is now nothing. And this re-experiencing our, ourselves in the presence of an empathic, non-judgmental, patient, and loving other person, the experience of that over time repairs those shameful, guilt-inducing feelings in ourselves. And, and what happens when you experience that over time, which I have because of my psychotherapist, not only does it heal my soul, but the first thing I want to do is offer that to others. It helped me become a better husband and a better father. Because now I know when my wife does something mean or cruel or stupid to me, or my children do something in their lives that's silly or, or they make a big mistake, I can't always do it, but I know that what they're needing is more love, more compassion in this process. So the feeling that you have, the self-criticism, the self-hatred that you have wasn't born into you. You didn't get born with this. I'm sure of that. That got introduced to your, to your context by people who thought 
that if you learn to hate bad things, bad mistakes, that you wouldn't do them. They didn't know that the cost was that it made you feel so horrible that you actually would do things like that. That's the great paradox. So how do you know if you're doing the work? There's a great line in the book that one of Jamie's books that she read called The Letters of Juliet to the Knight in Rusty Armor. It's a sequel. And there's this point where this, this protagonist in the story finds this magical guide in the forest. All of these things, of course, symbolic of the hero's journey, the journey that we're all on in some way or another. And she says at one point, she says, I didn't know if her house was a temple or if it was just a building with a roof on, on, on poles. And when I talk about that or teach that, I explain that's what psychotherapy feels like. We kind of go in and out of awareness. But if you find somebody who loves you, who loves your horrible, rotten self, right? That's the subtitle of my book, The Audacity to Be You, Learning to Love Your Horrible, Rotten Self. If you find somebody who loves your horrible, rotten self, despite what the world says, and you start to really deeply love your imperfect, flawed self, all of you, it doesn't turn you into a, a more self-indulgent, narcissistic person. It actually does the reverse. But we've been taught to fear such things. As, as love and compassion and non-judgment. We've been taught that people who experience those will act out greatly. So keep going. Make sure you have a, a good guy that, that has these qualities, that isn't trying to fix you. Psychotherapy, folks, yes, we can, we can make some progress in the immediate, for sure. Absolutely. We teach skills all the time. There are epiphanies along the way. But the fact of the matter is, it takes at least as long to heal the soul as it did to hurt the soul in the first place. So the, the complex PTSD that most people suffer from, which is the, the same thing as what we call attachment trauma or attachment wounding, it's really just called growing up in a human family. So the complex PTSD that all of us have that you're talking about here, you're not calling it that, but that's what it is. Gets healed in the same way that it was created. In the context of another person. So that old idea that you can do this on your own or that you can read. Yes, self-help books. I've written self-help books. They can help. They kind of anchor it. They expand our awareness for sure. All of those things. But you have to re-experience yourself. Like I said in the, in the Audacity to Be You. You have to re-experience yourself. When Jamie said, if you were having sex with a chicken, Brad, she said to me, I would just want to understand. I would be curious. And I would assume you had a good reason. And if you sit with somebody like that long enough, you start to love yourself. And you're human. And you've made mistakes. And they're not, in my opinion, they're not sins in the sense that you don't deserve love and you should be cast out. You made mistakes that are human mistakes because you were confused, because you don't have a strong connection to your soul, because you weren't, you weren't taught this. You, you didn't have that experience growing up. Sex and love addiction, which is this is a symptom of, is that, that search for that, that feeling that Johan Hari talks about in that TED Talk that I was describing, that feeling of deep and intimate connection. And when you have that, you won't need the drug. You won't need the sex. You won't need the gambling. You won't need the, the, the food that you don't need. You won't need those things because you will be full. And it takes a long, long, long time to heal that. And you deserve patience and understanding. So my heart is with you. And um, keep going. It's worth it. Somebody writes, what are the most important webinars to watch while your child is in treatment? Also, best books to read? Well, um, I'll tell you my favorites. I mean, first of all, this is going to sound silly. <laughs> it's, you're going to think I planted this question, but I didn't. But the most important books to read, in my opinion, of where you're at, 
are these two, and I wrote them. The Journey of the Heroic Parent is the first one. And the second one is the audacity to be you, learning to love your whole rotten self. But I'll tell you a few others that I draw upon uh, quite a bit. I draw upon um, Daniel Siegel's book, Parenting from the Inside Out. I think that that's, that's my favorite book on parenting that I didn't write. And it combines science and, and anecdotal experience and from the most renowned psychiatrist in the United States these days, Daniel Siegel, along with Mary Hartzell. So Parenting from the Inside Out, a tough read, a more advanced read, is the drama of the gifted child. If you are consumed by guilt and by the mistakes that you've made, which many of us are, this one can be heavy. But if you can read it from the perspective of being the child in the story, not thinking, just temporarily suspending your idea about being the parent, it teaches us about the the really important dynamics of parenting and being a child and child development. The drama of the gifted child, I'll, I'll break apart the title for you to, to tell you what it's about. The gifted child, it doesn't mean what you think it means. It doesn't mean the smart child, the child who's good in school, who, who has a high IQ or is in, in gifted curriculum and classes. The gifted child is the child who can sense what the parent needs, what the parent uh, needs that they are lacking. For example, does the parent need you not to be angry at them because they need to be good? Does the parent need you to be happy? Because if you are sad, then it's the parent's over-identification with that and their own self-hatred that my child has to be happy or I'm a bad parent. So the child, the gifted child senses what the parent needs that they didn't get from their childhood and then the child gives it to the parent. They become the good child or the happy child or the child with few needs or the child who's not too big or the child who's not too small. They become the thing that the parent needs to take care of the parent because if they don't, they fear at an unconscious level that the parent will abandon them. Now, what's the cost of this giving the parent what they need? It comes at the cost of the authentic self of the child or the real self, as, as the author Alice Miller puts it. It comes at, uh, at the cost of who you are. So then the work becomes later in life, reclaiming who you are, which is difficult and, me and messy in a world that is so much more complex for the individual than it was when they were just a child lying in a, in a, in a crib. Life was pretty simple back there. Keep me dry, keep me fed, burp me, let me sleep when I'm tired, and things generally go better. But when you're 25 years old or 35 years old or 55 years old, there are so many people and vari variables and circumstances that it's hard to make progress in all of that. So Drama the Gifted Child, Parenting from the Inside Out. I love the book, The Dance of Anger by Harriet Lerner. I think it's, it's my favorite book on boundaries. The Dance of Anger. It's a weird title, but basically what she, what she ex ex expounds on is this idea, if you don't take care of yourself, you're going to be resentful. You're going to be angry. You're going to be blaming other people for your unhappiness. But if you do battle with guilt, if you face your guilt and do the right thing in spite of the guilty feelings that it causes in you, if you do the right thing in spite of the shame that it triggers in you, and you learn to take care of yourself, and it can be messy because you don't have a lot of practice with this. You can go overboard sometimes. Everybody does, typically. That's what a midlife crisis is, going overboard. But if you have the space to do it and you keep working at it, you learn to take care of yourself. You learn to set boundaries. You learn to say no. You learn to say these things are negotiable in this relationship, in this circumstance, and these other things are not negotiable. And I have to take care of myself. So when you do take care of yourself, the outcome is more love, less anger, less judgment, less resentment, more joy, more capacity to give. So the dance of anger is on that list for sure. Anything that's written by James Hollis, I love. Those are a little bit more advanced. H-O-L-L-I-S, James Hollis. Um, anything that, that is written by J.D. Gill. Those are my two favorite authors. 
There are some others out there. Richard Rohr is a good author. Carl Jung. Uh, there's a lot of great authors out there. Um, but those are the ones that jump to mind. And then in terms of what webinars to look at, to listen to, or to look at when your child is, is in a program like ours, um, anything on codependency, I've probably done 10 on codependency. I've done, I've done broadcasts on all the books I just shared with you, including my own. I would start at the most recent and go backwards. And sometimes you'll be surprised. It's all the same thing, really. I'm just looking at different parts of the elephant. If you know that old analogy of the, the five blind men that are, that are describing the element, one's touching the tail, one's touching the ears, one's touching the feet, one's touching the trunk, and they describe the elephant. And they all have very different descriptions because they're touching and observing different parts. That's kind of what I do. It's one central core message that the goal of psychotherapy is to become who you are. It doesn't matter if you're a parent or a spouse or a child or just an individual person walking this earth. The goal is to become who you are. And to do that, we have to get past shame and guilt. We have to get past the, the, the lack of safety or, or the threat so that we can lower our defenses, get rid of them ultimately. In other words, help to, to dissipate the mental illness in us. And it's a lifelong journey. So, so I don't, there's not just one. I would start from the most recent and kind of go backwards. And if you start listening to one and after 10, 15 minutes, it doesn't feel like it's yours, just, just delete it and move on to the next one. There's about 600 titles, but it's just one story. It's the journey back to self and then learning how to support a child. And the great paradox, and I can say this with great confidence, I believe this, I know this from my own experience. The most important relationship that we have is the one that we have with ourselves. All other relationships are contingent on, on the quality of the relationship we have with ourselves. So we have to deal with ourselves. We have to deal with our anxiety. We have to own it, not make our children responsible for it. We have to deal with our depression, with our addictions, with our unhealed wounds. We have to deal with our tempers with our intensity, our, our intimidation, our inability to tolerate conflict and uncomfortable. We have to deal with those things. And our children are, are the medicine, if you will, that are, are, are awakening us, awakening us to, to the parts of ourselves that we have avoided so far in our lives. So thanks for the question. Somebody writes tonight, my husband's son, my stepson, has been estranged from us since COVID. He since had a daughter, and we have only met, whom we we've only met a few times, in the context of large family gathering gatherings, and he is now about to have a second child. My husband has reached out to him multiple times, offered to pay for therapy to get their relationship back on track, but he does not respond. It is so heartbreaking to be estranged from our grandchild, grandchildren, and and stepson son. Is there any way to come out, to come to terms with that, or should we keep trying to reach out? That is a really, really, really good question. Let me see if I can help with this. The first thing is you have to understand, well, you don't have to do anything, but let me start here. First, understand what it is about you that made it so that your stepson, son's only solution was to cut off contact. What was it about you? What personality characteristic? Most likely, the most common one is your defense, your, your husband's defense. That is the need to be good and right and not wrong. So that when your son says to you, you're not safe. Instead of trying to convince him that you are safe, your response is, thank you for telling me. And, and ideally, you can say, tell me more. Your, your stepson, the best guess is your stepson doesn't trust that your overtures to reach out will turn out any differently than they ever have in the past. It'll end up being his fault somehow. It'll end up being his limitation. And what he needs is he needs you and your husband to be big enough, healed enough, 
have enough ego strength to understand and know it is not the child's job to take care of the parent. It is the other way around. So you're going to have to listen to hard things and just keep your mouth closed. You're going to even have to listen to the reasons why he doesn't want to talk to you. So if I were engineering a, a, a sort of a conversation that I think gives you the best chance, it would sound something like this. And this has to be true. So you have to do the work to get here. That's why telling people what to say doesn't work because this has to come from the truth. But let me tell you what it sounds like so you can begin to recognize it in yourself or the lack of it in yourself. This is what it would look like. By the way, I don't think you necessarily give up. I don't have any opinions that you should give up. You can do what you want. But it would be a text or an email like, like this. It would sound like, you know what, son? I've been doing some work in the context of your sibling being in treatment or I went to an intensive or I found this guy on the inter internet talking about some things that felt different and interesting. And um, I realize I've had a lot of blind spots. And I'm starting to understand why you don't want to talk to me. And to be frank with you, if the decision that you make in your life is to never talk to me again, because that's the only way you can feel safe, I will support you in that. It'll leave a hole, but it's not your job to take care of me. That's my job. And I'm learning that for the first time. And I, ha I didn't even know what people meant when they said, that the child was taking care of the parent. I, I kind of knew what it meant in the most obvious and, and gross examples, the most primitive examples, but I didn't know what it looked like or felt like in the context of our family. And now I'm beginning to understand it and see it. And I'm sorry. And I'm going to give you the space, but every once in a while, I'm going to reach out to you and, and, Re-extend the invitation, just so you know that it's there. I want to understand myself better. I want to understand how I've contributed to this dynamic. I'm beginning to see my part in it, and I am sorry. And in, in a sense, maybe the most difficult part about me reaching out to you is that your decision to cut off from us is perfectly logical and makes all the sense in the world given your experience of being our child. And I have to live with that. But I'm learning to. So I love you. You can reply if you want to. Maybe I'll send you a, a message via the, these things every once in a while. Maybe I'll share with you as I come closer and closer to understanding and seeing my horrible rotten self. The more I learn to love myself, the more I can see all of me. But in the end, I just wanted to write and say, I'm sorry. And I should have listened, but I was too insecure and too unsure and too defended. And so what you're doing right now makes sense. I love you and I'll talk to you again sometime. That's the energy. That's what it would sound like. But it's so hard. We don't see it very clearly. We don't want to be wrong. We don't want to be bad. We don't want to have failed. We don't want to be the reason. You know, the, the, I shared a quote from Shams Tabrizi, which is Rumi's spiritual teacher, who said, all the prophets agree on this one thing. If you want to grow spiritually, find a mirror. I wrote recently this idea that go to therapy until you know what to apologize about to the people that, that love you. And, 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 and again, that doesn't come from... If your mind is still stuck in the equation, the mathematical equation of who's more right and who's part of it, this is not that. This is beyond that. This is beyond right doing and wrong doing. This is, I know, I know I have some stuff and I know I put it on you. And I'm sorry. And it doesn't matter what you did or not. We can talk about that another, another time. But I want to tell you, I understand now how I dented you and I bruised you. And there are probably some ways that I still don't see. And I'm working on having enough strength and self-love to get there. But that's the work. That's the work. And again, it's painful and it's slow, but I will tell you, it's 
the best thing in the world. It's the best thing in the world. You are free. You find peace. And you're more capable of loving people, especially the people that are close to you. And when you stumble and fall, because you will, I will stumble and fall tonight when I leave this office. I will make mistakes with my children. I will make mistakes with my wife tonight and tomorrow and the next day and the next day and the next day. Because everybody does and I'm one person, a, a part of that group of everybody. But the secret is to pick myself up back off the, groom, uh, off the, off the ground. Excuse me. The secret is to pick myself back up off the ground, to sit with myself, to see my part, and to be accountable to it, accountable for it. And to find places to heal and to feed myself, because if I come to the relationship or the conversation starving, malnourished, spiritually and psychologically speaking, I will eat the other person. But if I come with a full belly, spiritually, psychologically speaking, then I have more capacity to love. I won't need to spend my energy in the service of being a good person, in the service of my ego, in the service of being right, of not being the one to blame, not the one at fault. I will have enough strength, enough self-love that I can love you. I love this quote. I shared this today on my own social media from the Buddhist monk Thich Nhat Hanh. He said, to love, to love is, first of all, to accept ourselves as we are. That's why the finding you is so important. That's why psychotherapy for the parent is so important. It doesn't matter what the problem is. It doesn't matter if it's a marriage problem. It doesn't matter if it's a problem with a child who's struggling. You are the, you know, you are the place to go. Greater self-awareness. Become more conscious. And to become more conscious, you have to learn to love yourself more. And learning to love yourself happens in the context principally of other people that can love you being in that context changes you so that's the work thank you for asking somebody says my child has gone through wilderness and a residential treatment center for the past year and hasn't seen all of the negative images documentaries etc out there about the type of programs that there are now they will be coming home soon and i'm not sure how to address it without my child jumping on the negative bandwagon in truth, it has been hard for my child, but it has also been transformative for them. And they have much more positive outlook. And us parents, too. How do we talk to our children about this without sugarcoating, but also acknowledging how far they've come? I think it's not the only thing that I think is in play. There's a few things in play. But I think the principal contribution that we parents have to those documentaries and those, those news articles that are out there Again, as we try to be right, when your child comes home and says, this was the worst thing you ever did to me, I'm going to give you a, a kind of response that shows you what it feels like. It's not the words. And again, they have to be true. That's why I can't tell you what to say. But what it would look like is, I'm sorry. Tell me about all the horrible things about being in wilderness and RTC. And you say things like, oh my gosh, that must have been so hard. That shouldn't have happened. It's no different than if your child went to college and had bad experiences, which they will. Right? But the reason that we defend and want them to be positive, right? The reason that that happens is because we're the one that sent them. And we don't want it to have been a bad experience. Well, there are bad things that happen. There are staff that are jerks. There are therapists that aren't skilled or make mistakes all the time. So if you let your children be angry, the anger will go away. If you want your child to be happy, the anger will stay forever and actually get larger. And so one dynamic, I'm convinced after talking to these kids that, that, that has an impact is that parents want the kids to think positively of it. You don't get to decide. Let them be angry. Let them be resentful. And the more you let them feel those things, the more those feelings go away. They metabolize. They disappear. In the movie, Parenting from the Inside Out. No, oh, excuse me. That's the book that I mentioned. In the movie, Inside Out, Amy Poehler stars in it and there's a couple of others. It's a cartoon. It's a child's movie. And, and the whole story is about these feelings inside of that. In fact, Inside Out 2 is coming out, I heard. 
I'm really excited to see how that's going to be. But in the movie, it's about this 12 year old girl and, and we get to see inside of her brain. We get to see anger, disgust, sadness, and joy. And I think maybe fear. Those five feelings. And, and it shows us kind of what drives our human behavior. And at one point in the story on the outside, this young 12 year old girl, their family moved from Minnesota, I think, to the Bay Area, to San Francisco. So she's left all of her friends. She's left her, her hockey team. She played hockey. She's in a new school. There's a moment when she talks about the people here in San Francisco. They like pineapple on their pizza, right? She's left the culture, everything that's comfortable. She's, she's in a very sad place at a very, very difficult time being in that middle school age, right? And at one point, the mother's trying to get her to talk at the dinner table in this movie, in this story. And she's moping and looking down. And the, the, the mother kicks the father under the table to get his attention because it shows inside of his head and he's thinking about football. So he is startled and becomes awake to what is happening right in front of him. And he asks his daughter questions, tries to get her to engage. And she again gives, gives a mopey, depressed answer with some tone to it, of course, because she's a teen or a preteen. And he says, where did my good little girl go? And I know that's just a cartoon and I know it's not your life, but that's what happens. She's experienced significant loss and trauma that wasn't her choice. And because she's sad and a, a little bit of tone, mom and dad say, where's our good little girl? So she learns it's not okay to be her. She has to be happy to make the parents feel okay. You know, it's my birthday this week, by the way. It's my birthday in two days. And so my family, we're, we're going out to dinner on Friday night as a family to celebrate the day after my birthday. And my 16 year old has a new guy that she's talking to. And she asked me last night, she said, you know, do you want him there? Can he come? And I said, do you want him there? And she said, well, yeah, I'd like him there, but do you want him there? And I said, if you want him there, I want him there. I mean, my daughter is bringing her fiance, of course. I'm bringing my wife. I think my son is bringing the, the woman that he's dating, my 31-year-old son. So even though you've been only talking to this guy for a little bit, if you want him to come, you want some company, bring him. And I said, I was kind of being funny about it. I was, I was cooking dinner and I was in a good mood. I said, I know why you asked the question though, because sometimes we treat 16 year old people like they're not people. If my 29 year old daughter, who's now engaged, but if she were dating somebody even for two weeks and she said she wanted to bring somebody, I would be okay with it. But somehow because you're 16 and you're probably not going to marry this guy. And maybe I don't like some, I don't like the way his hair is cut. I was saying all of this out loud, kind of flippantly. I'm not going to treat you like a person and you can't bring him because you don't really know yourself. But this is how you learn to know yourself. So yeah, if you want them to come, if it'll make the dinner better, bring your person. I'm okay with it. I'll just be happy to be with all of you celebrating my birthday. And she said in, in a very sincere way, she said, that's why I love you, dad. And it was playful and it was light. And, but I was trying to illustrate my own. And I said to her, I said, I wasn't always like this. Five or 10 years ago, I might have said, no, this is just for family or for significant others. And he's not qualified as a significant other yet. I would have justified it, but I wouldn't have treated you like a human. I told her, and I'm learning to treat you like a human. And when we're 16, when we're 16, we don't know ourselves. But we don't know ourselves when we're 26 or 36 or 46 or 56 sometimes. We're still working on it. And we need to give our children their dignity in this way to treat them like a human. So just listen to them. Let them have their feelings. Let them think what they want. Be unattached to it. And the more you do that, the less they'll get fixated and stuck in their anger and their resentment. 
the more you want them to get over their anger and their resentment and their sadness and their grief of having been sent away for a couple of years, even though all of you might see how helpful it was, the quicker and more you want them to get over that, the more likely it is that they will get stuck in their anger because that's what happens to people. That is what psychology and child development teaches us. Let them be their sel themselves. Somebody wished me a happy birthday and noticed it was Pi Day. Thank you very much. I love that it's Pi Day and that I shared my birthday with Einstein and Steph Curry. All right, looks like that's all the questions I have for this evening. Like I said, the journey of the rogue parent and the audacity to be you are available on Amazon and Audible. If you want to do a deep dive, I, I, I just can't say it enough. I believe this is the best investment of time and money that you can make. March 20th through 24th is the next in-person offering. It's one week from tonight. If you can make it happen, we can help you to make it happen. Contact intensives at evoketherapy.com. April 10th through 14th after that. May 17th through 19th is an online offering. We have custom programs for couples, families, and co-parents. Just go to our website or contact intensives at evoketherapy.com. If you are a current or alumni parent of our wilderness program, the next support group online that's available is March 14th, 7 p.m. Mountain Time. Once a month, we have an alumni-only meeting of our wilderness program, parents of our wilderness program. March 18th at 6 p.m. Mountain Time is that offering. And then for our intensives and coaching current and alumni, uh, March 8th, or excuse me, April 8th is our next offering, April 8th, 6 p.m. Mountain Time. If you want to know more, you can scan the QR code there on the screen, go to our website, or email us at supportgroups at evoketherapy.com. I haven't made a big deal about this lately, but I, but I want to. If you want to work with somebody one-on-one -on -one who could do this work, now that everybody's more comfortable doing things virtually, we started a coaching program. These are therapists and coaches who have been trained in the attachment-based model that I talk about and I teach from all the time. They can help you with boundaries. They can help you with marital issues, intimacy issues, codependency issues, transitioning home with children, parent, you know, the gamut. They can help you. Contact coaching at evoketherapy.com if you want to get matched up with one of our coaches. We ask all parents, all people that are listening to me, I just invite you to consider this is free. So if money is an obstacle for the psychotherapy, these groups do a fantastic, in fact, I think these do groups do better than a, a lot of therapists to support people on the he healing journey. We encourage you to try six of any combination of the following groups, alanon.org, coda.org, familiesanonymous.org, adultchildren.org, refugerecovery.org, or the National Alliance on Mental Illness has classes and resources in your local communities. All of these broadcasts are available via the podcast format. You can go to Spotify or your favorite podcast app on your phone. You can search Finding You in Evoke Therapy Podcast and click there and like us and follow us, and you'll be notified when the new episodes drop. You can also go to soundcloud.com in your computer and find Finding You, the Finding You podcast there. You can also go to Evoke's YouTube channel and watch the rebroadcast of the video versions of these with the slides and the quotes. You can find Evoke Therapy programs and me, Dr. Brad Reedy, on X, Threads, and Instagram using the handles at Evoke Therapy and at Dr. Brad Reedy, respectively. You can find Evoke Therapy Intensives on Instagram using the handle Evoke Therapy Intensives. And on Facebook, you can find us by searching either Evoke Therapy Programs or Evoke Therapy Inter Intensives. And of course, our blog has wonderful content each week. All right, folks, on my birthday, I'm still working, celebrating it on Friday. I'm going to be talking about myth, story, and the hero's journey to discover ourselves. I'm actually hosting a, a book, not a book club, but I'm calling it the dinner table conversation. I have my inaugural one tomorrow night, March 13th at 5 p.m. Uh, Pacific time, I think. Or, well, yeah, it's at 5 p.m. Pacific time is, I think, what I've listed it as. You can go to my social media and find it there. If you're interested, you can, you can email me or message me because it's $10 to join. It's open for anybody listening. And tomorrow night, our first inaugural session, we're going to be talking about the movie Everything, everywhere, all at once. Won the Academy Award a couple of years ago in the context of this hero's journey, this journey to become ourselves. I thought that'd be a great one to start with because it's such an epic hero's journey and it does such a good job of distracting us from the journey with all of the, 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 the shiny objects on it. So 
it does a good job to represent how life is for us because we all get distracted sometimes. All right, folks, I hope this was a helpful point of contact to you. I really do. Um, be kind to yourself. Learn to love yourself. Spend some more time with people who love and don't judge you. Not just the beautiful, pretty, smart, talented parts of you, but the, the parts of you that make mistakes, the human parts of you. And for and on behalf of the people that you love and the people that love you, thank you for showing up and being willing to do your work. It makes all the difference in the world. Have a great evening. I'll talk to you in two nights. Take care. Bye-bye.